This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So now we're going to move to the, the second part of this discussion, uh, the demand side. You employers, you've just heard what the supply side has, has to say. What do you think? Are you going to find your new employees the way uh, you used to? Are they going to be there? Who wants to take the first crack at that? Well, go ahead, Gene. I'll start off. I, I, I came here feeling good about myself and about the work that Southern California Edison does in supporting uh, institutions such as these, not just ones like Santa Barbara's Institute for Energy Efficiency, which is in our territory, or the 10 other colleges and universities in our territory we support, but also the Davis Center as well. But, but I walk away from this conversation thinking about the thing that's been left undone, and that is the human connection between we as employers, or the demand side, as Alan would put it, and you as the supply side. It isn't enough, and I will, I will say this to our president who is sitting here in the audience somewhere, it isn't enough that we put the big check uh, in the envelope and mail it off to you all and expect you to do great things. As I come out to visit, visit David in a couple of months or at the board meeting tomorrow for the UC Davis Center uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, I need to be more actively engaged in guiding what it is that you produce, in allowing you to customize what you produce so that I can make it used and useful on day one when it pops out. And my last thought is I am not leaving today without Mo's resume, so David, <laughs> I want that. Gene, you'll have to fight me for that resume. <laughs> uh, uh, Roland, I think I saw your hand up first. And Yes, I was going to uh, observe something uh, slightly different, and that is I believe everyone we heard from uh, the university side sounds like a great plan you've got. You've got great students, and yeah, you have your challenges, but you're addressing those challenges. What's missing is all the other educational institutions that aren't here at this table. And to do this at the scale and scope we need to, we need this as broadly uh, as possible across the nation. And I don't know how we move that dialogue forward, because I think that's what's essential to have this be successful. Cheryl. I have to, I, I definitely agree with, with Gene. There's more that we can be doing. Um, we've been doing some, but not enough, in terms of working with the institutions to make sure that our needs are addressed um, going forward. Um, one thing that I do want to explore a little bit further and, and maybe get some feedback from the supply side on is how uh, we can actually fill the gap on continuing education. For those folks already in the field who have a lot of talent, we're seeing this quite a bit. We're moving into a lot of new states because energy efficiency is moving into a lot of new states. There are enormous opportunities. We've got these great institutions in California, but as Roland mentioned, this, this type, these types of institutions don't exist everywhere. And as a matter of fact, they don't exist very many places. Um, and we're finding the same in the NGO community. We've got a lot of really talented people with a lot of experience in a lot of these different states that haven't been doing a lot of energy efficiency and so are lacking that experience. As we produce a lot more of these great new generation arts, we need people in those institutions that are going to be able to support them when they come in. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to move into institutions that don't have that grounding. So I'd like to hear a little bit from the supply side on how we can actually improve the continuing education part of this. And obviously, we as the NGOs have a role in that as well. Jim, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd echo a lot of my panelists' comments in that. Um, you know, when you move outside of California, um, you really sort of drop off a cliff. Uh, and, you know, I speak at a lot of different universities, and I can remember, boy, probably just over five years ago, I wanted to go and speak at a class at Stanford, 
that was a, um, uh, an MBA class uh, focused on sustainability, and there maybe were uh, six to ten students in it, and now it's standing room only. So we see the, the increase in the student interest and demand in, in uh, uh, the panelists uh, on, the, uh, on the supply side. Uh, but when I go around and speak at other universities outside of California, um, it's like those old days again, um, where it's, it's few and far between. It, there's a huge lack of understanding uh, about the field. Uh, there are uh, so many other opportunities for these, uh, these top students to go into that are competing with energy efficiency. And really, uh, when you think about um, the students who have the aptitude and the passion, the interest, we're also competing against, you know, the whole renewable energy, you know, side as well. You know, they want to go and work in solar and wind and, you know, and fuel cells, and not necessarily, you know, in more the traditional energy efficiency side. Uh, it's a little bit more glamorous and and sexy than than energy efficiency. Uh, so I think there's a overall education. Uh, challenge in, in communicating across, broadly across. And then there's the global aspect as well. Uh, Chevron does business in close to 180 countries around the world. And uh, I go around and uh, meet with host governments uh, where we do business, and they're all interested in energy efficiency and renewable energy, uh, but they all want to hear what's going on in California, because that's you know, where they, they see globally where all the action is. So I think another challenge is how do we export uh, this expertise globally? Uh, we helped set up in, uh, in Qatar, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Doha, uh, the uh, Center for Sustainable Energy Efficiency. And we've got Texas A&M there, uh, I think Carnegie Mellon's there, a few other U.S.-based uh, educational institutions are there, uh, but there's a huge opportunity for the supply side to get involved in those types of centers that are being created all around the world, because this is a global challenge, not just a local challenge. Gene, I think you were going to say something. No, no. No? no. Okay. Uh, let's turn around to the, uh, to the supply side again. Did you uh, feel like uh, these people are ready to, to uh, come to your aid where necessary, uh, hire your graduates w uh, as soon as they're uh, minted, and uh, basically uh, m make the supply and demand match. Anybody want to start? Go ahead. Um, yes, I, first I, I wanted to just make an observation. It was clear that uh, the style of presentation is very different on the left side of the room than on the right side of the room. I think we were a little more long-winded than you were, but uh, we perhaps uh, that's the academic spirit. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, relate a conversation I had uh, uh, with um, uh, Steve Chu, the Secretary of uh, Energy, on Friday. He was on our campus, and he'd come out to uh, visit our Energy Frontier Research Center. And in the course of that uh, visit, we had a discussion with Steve about uh, one of his favorite topics, which is uh, what he calls the uh, energy hubs. Uh, a new vehicle for actually providing not just centers of excellence, but, but uh, cooperative and coordinated uh, activity in not just research, but in education and in industry ties and things of that sort. And of course, we, were, we knew about this, and we were pummeling Steve with all kinds of questions. You know, how can we get one? How can we get one? And Steve just said, hey, wait a second. You don't need DOE. You can create a mini hub all on your own if you want to. And it was a really interesting comment that he made. And, and what he meant was that uh, there is a need for universities to be more connected with the communities, plural, not just industry, but with those in government in other ways. And of course, we do some of this, but we haven't done it, in my opinion, in a coordinated way. And in keeping with this concept that uh, Steve has uh, developed at, uh, at uh, DOE of, of a hub, uh, but he was saying, uh, you know, this is a concept that applies broadly. It doesn't have to be directed by DOE or funded by DOE. It can be done in partnership with all of those con constituent elements in the community if you'll just go out and do it. And I just wanted to throw that out there as a, as a comment because I think it, it addresses many of the questions that are coming from the uh, demand side. 
I can see Dan really wants to say something. So I'm actually going to, I guess, continue the trend of the too long academic answers because there was a range of points, and I, I'd like to kind of respond or, or jiggle things a bit in a number of points. I want to start off, though, with something that Andy said, which I think is really important. He either said or coined, I'm going to give you the coined category, this T-shaped student, which sounds a bit like a hammerhead shark, but I'm going to uh, uh, use another aspect of it, and that is that one of the challenges on the university side for a very long time, maybe not right now, but for a very long time, was worrying about breadth versus depth. And a huge argument against making programs that nurture the interdisciplinary, energy-savvy student with skills and areas from where many of us came in who modeled after art, myself a, a reformed or fallen phys or wandering physicist who, who came in the path that art and John Holdren and others, John Hart and many people took. But having that combination of depth and breadth has been a real bugaboo for universities. And any university that says they've solved it is so far still lying. Because they've solved it only because very strong individuals or case studies have allowed them to smooth over a real fundamental gap. Part of that is that, again, as I said in my first comments, these programs largely exist where they do exist because there was some unique hole that got filled. Literally, Gil Masters filled a hole in a trailer at Stanford and filled it up with great students. Our program, ERG at Berkeley, lived for a long time in temporary buildings that lasted slightly too many decades, but literally temporary buildings. Part of the need is to think about ways to make this more institutional. And so while I actually disagree with the, um, with the efficiency panel in the sense that we're unique in California. I think when you go to University of Tennessee and Cornell and Brown and um, Texas A&M and Texas Austin, you find versions of these such that there are local conditions admitted or permitted in many places. The problem is, what's the next stage? I actually think we should have, in many colleges of engineering, a department of energy. Because one of our problems isn't that there's a gas turbine expert, and there's an efficiency expert, and there's a vehicle expert, and there's an energy economics person, but that these people need to be a hub of power. They need to be, if you will, one of these mini hubs intellectually. Because energy is, if we pull together our collective experience, much more than a set of neat applications of these other technologies. And I, there's one, there's many crowning examples. One of my favorites is that when we talk about the need for people who do energy and we focus in a very well-established system, for example, within PG&E PG territory, we'll talk about the need to push along the energy efficiency programs. And Diane Gurnich is here and she'll talk about the big, bold ideas on efficiency. But yet, when I work with my now 19-year-old laboratory that's based in the University of, of Nairobi, that program is all about bringing basic energy services and thinking about how does energy at the urban level, if it's pursued, mean deforestation in rural communities through charcoal trains. And we'll have Evan Mills and, and Ashok Gadgil talk a little bit later on about these things. What combines these conversations around the world is energy services. And planners and policymakers and most individuals don't give a rat's you know what about whether this is an efficiency discussion or it's a supply side discussion. They care about getting those energy services. Now, we know there are critical lenses on climate change where getting 80% or more of the carbon out of that service is needed. We also know about the hawks and doves discussions about energy security and whether it's secure to be getting oil sands, I mean tar sands, I mean oil sands energy as more secure than Venezuelan, uh, Saudi Arabian, or Nigerian oil is a question. But we know lots of lenses on this. What we don't have, even with big checks, and by the way, those big checks need to get bigger, or we won't get it, um, is that we need to make thinking about energy as a system a center of power. And unfortunately, the stimulus money is not a sustainable mechanism, at least not yet. The fact that all of the savvy program managers at DOE and EPA and HUD and others who see that money are thinking about how they can stick the knife in their neighboring programs, because when the stimulus money ends, they're going to be fighting for a pie 
that unless things change, is going to ramp down towards where it was before, not sustained at this level. If we don't take this moment to build kind of a sustainable infrastructure, we will get the quote unquote good guys and good women fighting with each other more than the outside story. And that's going to require a new type of infrastructure to make those T-shaped students happen. So developing country programs, I think that the Energy Foundation's example of working with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and many others to build expertise and partnerships on both sides of the Pacific is a great example of building up the capacity on the Chinese side. And when I say there's great programs forming at Cornell's and Tennessee's and elsewhere, I also mean at Tsinghua and Beida, but also lesser known places like the North China Electric Power University. There are lots of allies out there if there was more of a nexus. So I'll, I'll come back to my initial features. I believe in, in you know, making it real, and I think that part of it is going to have to be you know, that hardware we're going to need, whether it's buildings for these students, whether it's programs that bridge advanced research universities and advanced training and community colleges and programs in developing countries. But we're going to have to build the physical infrastructure at remarkable record pace so that we don't see the end of the stimulus money as a battle between old and new thinking. We have to do much more what Andy said, and that is to build a next version, whether it's smarter on IT, whether it's smarter on political issues, or whether it's just making these motivators that brought many people here to think about art's legacy, a different thing going forward. How do we do not just incremental changes in efficiency, but deep cuts? Things like, I mean, we're very proud of the PACE program um, in Berkeley and now beyond and part of the Wax and Markey Bill, et cetera, as a way to marry efficiency and renewables together. So I know I've done a long-winded version, which I promised, but the real message was what goes forward has to be dramatically better connected and supported, or we will look back on this as a neat episode in time, much the way that many of us look back on the OPEC response as a neat episode in time, but one that didn't have the legs that it should have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any other comments from uh, Jane or Andy? Do you want to? I guess I was. That is long winded. I should interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> I did promise to be long winded. <laughs> Cheryl, I'm curious on the policy side, given um, talking about the, what's needed in terms of uh, institution, ac educational institutional depth outside of California. So, given what I view as the success of a million dollar carrot being thrown out in PG&E's territory to uh, innovate around at least a first generation of energy, uh, energy efficiency center excellence. Is, there, is it in the policy quiver to incentivize uh, state utility commissions to use money, ratepayer money, to create golden carrots to um, incentivize institutions in Tennessee or Indiana or whatever state it might be where you and Jim are finding less uh, robust pools of students and faculty. I mean, how, I, I guess I would, I feel like people in your shoes actually have some of the skills and talented policy people to think about how to create that as much as, you know, we're trying to create the next generation of faculty for institutions like that, but those institutions in those states need some of the same incentive our institutions needed to get going on this topic. Is that something you considered, both from Chevron's point of view or NRDC's point of view? Uh, Andy, do you mind waiting for a moment? And uh, you, you demand side people. You want to try to address that question? Um, well, in a lot of these states, of course, it's a challenge just to get things going in terms of energy efficiency. But we always um, advocate at the same time uh, training programs uh, and that kind of thing. Um, obviously, once a, a utility starts doing energy efficiency, um, you know, that is one of the areas that we look at, but probably not enough, because I think most of the focus in these states right now is just getting these programs off the ground, getting the policies established, getting the right incentives in place so that there is actually sustainable investment in energy efficiency. So you're right, that should be one of the, the, the basic level um, thoughts and conversations in terms of, uh, I think, funding coming from that source 
right at the start, I think it's a little bit more difficult. But I, I do think that there's, there's a, a real positive trend um, in terms of you know, companies and, and corporations actually writing those big checks, and that's something that we need to, not necessarily through the, the, the bill pair dollars even, um, and that's something that we need to really push to expand um, across the rest of the country. Jim? We operate in virtually every state uh, in the country, and our best opportunities are where um, electric rates are highest and system reliability is lowest. Um, and you know that tends to take you to the coasts um, and uh, states that have uh, cheap, plentiful energy uh, tend not to be great. Uh, markets for us, um, and I think as uh, you know, there's there's a saying that I that I uh, sometimes use when I'm when I'm, I'm challenged on uh, the business model and uh, energy efficiency, which is you know no one is as green as what's in their wallet, and you know when there's not a lot of savings to be had, um, there's not a lot of uh, business opportunity for us, and there's not a lot of uh, desire by uh, our customers to do it, and therefore, you know, there's not going to be a growing business model in that state, and academia in that state is going to sort of follow where, you know, the business opportunities are for their graduates. So if there's uh, policy that can help incentivize energy efficiency, that's going to bring companies like ours to those states, and I think there'll be the follow-on effect by, by academia. Uh, so that's kind of the, the landscape that we operate in. Um, and, you know, that, that's why California is far and away the best market uh, for our business. Andy. Hi. Perfect time. I, I'm, I'm actually happy to follow these guys on, on exactly those comments. I, 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 because I want to pull them back to, to uh, uh, David and Dan's uh, uh, points about creating uh, you know, hubs within the university setting. I think this is one of the uh, most important aspects of what we can be doing going forward, which is focusing on the connections, not just within academia. And I think, I mean, certainly we in the university have been guilty of, of, of uh, you know, sort of the kindergarten play, which is playing well alone next to each other. You know, we don't steal each other's toys. We don't, uh, comp well, sometimes we steal each other's grants if possible. But, but for the most part, we coexist peacefully. And I think we've got to break that mold and, and find ways in which, in fact, research can inform one another uh, within the university. Uh, but also to, to bring it out is to, to, to think about the networks that we need to be building between research and business industry and, and policymakers. And here's where I think, you know, one of the things that I think I'm most proud of with the Energy Efficiency Center at Davis is the network that it's created that has people, you know, like our panel here, you know, uh, attending our board meeting and has their staff involved with our researchers and involved with our students in trying to identify the business and policy implications of technology, the technology and business implications of policy. And, and have that conversation going because I can't tell you the number of entrepreneurs and scientists who would spend years otherwise trying to get that very information in the usual ways, knocking on doors, sending emails, making phone calls, and not getting them returned. I, I think one of the most important aspects uh, for affecting change in energy efficiency right now is short-circuiting what has become, a, or what, is, what remains a, a very fragmented set of relationships between science, policy, and business. Um, you know, to, to, to a very serious uh, or specific point on that, I want to respond to Cheryl's earlier call about continuing ed and retrofitting the existing. You know, one of the things we find is, you know, what's holding energy efficiency back in the adoption side, you know, from building managers, energy managers, they don't know how to compare energy efficiency to alternative energy forms that are a lot more sexy and are getting on the covers of a lot more newspapers. But even beyond that, they don't know change management in organizations. They don't know leadership in politics. They don't know, you know, influence and, um, 
and finance, or you know, let alone the, the sort of the taxes and subsidies associated. These are skill sets that are holding back the adoption of energy efficiency in businesses. And if you don't give the energy managers in, in businesses, the plant managers, those skill sets, no amount of great science is going to take root. So we do need to reach out and bring those people in as well and provide them with a set of skills that we don't necessarily associate with energy efficiency but are absolutely critical to moving those ideas out into the field. And I think it's that kind of conversation where you get in and you realize, well, what are the real barriers? What are the obstacles? And, and oftentimes it turns out it's not more science. It's not better science. It's uh, what Jim said, which is finding ways to uh, allow new business models to emerge. And whether those new business models come out of an energy manager putting together the right presentation, which shows a value proposition with low risk in a company, or it's an entrepreneur pursuing you know, a project that allows, uh, um, for example, in our West Village program, for zero net energy communities. Because those are a much more cost effective and profitable approach than forcing everybody to have a zero net energy building. And, you know, the, but these are where business development and technology development and policy development have to come together. And, you know, and it's, in, it's in, the, um, in service of producing these new opportunities, these new business models, as Jim said. And I, th and I think you know, really it's our charge, all of us, to kind of create these networks that allow us to do that together. Thank you. Now, I, I think, that, at least from my perspective, these discussions have shown that there really aren't enough arts to go around, and that just like uh, the energy business, we, we need both supply side and demand side strategies. So that both educators and the employers n need to take actions to make that market clear. And we heard some of those, those, um, uh, those actions. Uh, and you know, a couple of them that uh, I, I, I wrote down included Gene's comment that we need now some cold-blooded energy efficiency experts. Hadn't really thought about it that way before. Uh, and, and I liked uh, also the, the, the important comment that we needed to deal with retrofitting the existing staff uh, to be, make them more expert in energy efficiency. And then we even heard comments like, uh, maybe we should have a department of energy inside the universities. And I think there were many other comments, but um, I hope that this conversation will stimulate further discussions during the coffee breaks, lunch, and, uh, and afterwards. So. With that, I'd like to thank the participants for giving their views and uh, beginning this event so provocatively. So thank you very much.